transitioning to life in the diaspora at times can be challenging for anyone, whether you're an adult, a young person. And uh, but even with those challenges, God can immensely bless us, uh, cause us to flourish, cause us to be our best. And our guest today is one who has had diverse challenges, diverse challenges to near getting so close of being repatriated to the place where God has blessed him with abundance and blessed his family immensely. So I really hope this story inspires you as you, maybe you're planning to travel to the, to the US or Europe, wherever it is, or uh, you are already here and life is just being had and this inspires you as you dive in. So uh, welcome my guest, Emmanuel Tucker. Tell us Thank a little you. about you. Thank you. Thank you. And to Velma, Sister Velma, I don't know what, <laughs> you know, um, so I'm Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel Taco, and uh, I'm a dad, uh, you know, and a family man. I'm married, uh, and I have four kids, uh, twins, Dante and Bella, who are two years plus. I have Nova, who's about nine months, and I have a 13-year-old as well. Uh, Leah. So uh, I'm from Iowa, but originally from Cameroon. I moved to the United States in February of 2015. And, uh, you know, since then, you know, there's been a lot that has happened, you know, and, you know, here am I today, by the grace of God, you know, established and, you know, doing well for myself. And, uh, you know, also, doing well for the kingdom, you know, and just doing what I love and what I do best. So uh, I don't know how deep you want me to go. Okay, I can talk yeah, about that's, that's, that's good. Uh, right, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's good. So, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't know why I thought you, have, you were here before 2015. Well, I came here February of 2015. That date okay. never, leaves, never leaves my mind. It's... Oh wow! So, what, did you come when your was was your mom here when you came? Yes, she was here when oh, I came. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yes. Oh, wow. okay, I thought you came before. I don't know why that was in mind. N no. Maybe, maybe it was your uncle that I had in mind. Okay. Because I know that yeah. somebody who left a lot longer, like earlier when I was still in Limbe. I think it must have been him. Yes, probably. Yeah. Okay. Oh my! Okay, tell us a little uh, because. I think I've known you. You were a little boy. I remember. Yes. <laughs> we'll come to the house with the twins and and yes. so tell us a little about um, uh, your encounter with Jesus. How did you come to know the Lord and uh, just how who you were and what you did before you ever got to the U.S. Okay. Yeah, that's a very good question and it's pretty robust. So uh, <laughs> you permit me to go every look and corner to bring out the answers, right? So yeah. as I introduced myself, um, I was born in Cameroon, Limbe, precisely, uh, to a family of, uh, you know, five. I'm the first of five boys. And uh, my mom and my dad are still alive by the grace of God, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Tako. And uh, I'll say I was born into a Christian home, uh, which is not a privilege everybody has. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that setting really introduced me to the faith at a very young age. So I don't, I don't exactly recall the exact age at which I gave my life to Christ, but I remember I was very young. And there's a lot of things I did not understand. So that tells you how young I was, you know. <clears throat> my mom being a servant of God who answered the call, you know, at, uh, you know, um, a very crucial time in her life as well. You know, she used to be a lecturer, um, you know, an adjunct le lecturer at the University of Ottawa, Canada, um, where she was on scholarship, doing really well. And that was where, you know, the Lord spoke to her to come back to her home country, Cameroon, where she was going to, you know, serve him, you know, under the leadership that he was going to instruct. And her journey in itself, you know, is one of the reasons why I still stand and where I am today, because she laid that foundation. And each time I'm discouraged or anything comes in the way, I tend to reflect back, back on, you know, her story and her journey with God. And it's that in itself is a booster for me, you know, yeah. 
Um, you know, so just to give a little bit of context, you know, she accepted the call, you know, God said, I'm going to, you know, show my people because back then people thought people who serve God are just people who are frustrated and really have nothing to do, you know, and they're just like, well, maybe I can open a church, yes. <laughs> get some members and, you know, get things going, you know, and the narrative was really a little bit faulty. And I believe that was a season where God was trying to, you know, um, bring a new, you know, set of people, you know, maybe the elites or people who think, you know, uh, uh, you know, God is just for, you know, the average person out there. So my, my mom, you know, being someone who was known as, you know, an iron lady, that's how she was, you know, dubbed iron lady, you know, she was. intellectual. Oh, she is. Yeah. <laughs> Highly intellectual, and you know, and the Lord told her, "I'm going to use you to show people that I can also use, you know, people who are, you know, highly educated to serve me." And that was a very tough call for her because her immediate family then did not understand what was going on, and you know, th that's a story on its own. But you know, long story short, you know, here is my mom, you know, servant of God, um, under you know, the discipleship and leadership of, uh, you know, her then um, spiritual father, who is the head of Discipline the Nations Ministry, uh, Dr. Ha Rahman, you know, and uh, she she basically created that atmosphere, you know, where I grew up. So I grew up learning the values and the disciplines of the faith. Um, I remember the day that she led me to give my life to Christ. We were actually, I remember that day we were in our home in Kaplimbo. That's in okay. the homes in Sonora. That day I remember I was, we were at the veranda praying. I don't recall those sessions, but I knew we used to have some sessions where she would, you know, have us pray and learn memory verses. It was kind of like a, a devotion kind of time. And, you know, I remember that day, that was the day she led me to Christ. It was, it's just funny how I can remember it, although I was still very young. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, she led me to Christ, you know, and, you know, I, I had the, the, the knowledge that now I am a born again. You know, I'm a child of God and I've been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. Yeah. You know, there was a little bit of that understanding of what had taken place. You know, it was a serious moment of my life where I was a new creation. And uh, that was about it. But I still did not, as a child, you know, did not have those natural desires, but I was in an environment that groomed the desire, you know, to, you know, get into the things of God. So she would, you know, of course, drag us, you know, to church, you know, Bible study, register us for Bible camps. That's when we got immersed into, you know, discipling the nation's ministry, which was then, you know, uh, the ministry that she was, you know, submitted under. And we're heavily involved. And that's really where I got to know, you know, you, um, Antivelma, who also played a very, you know, a, a big role because you worked a lot with, at some point you worked with youths, you know, young people, and we, then we crossed paths. And you're probably one of those who, you know, mentored me to an extent. Um, I even remember my mom sending me over to your family house where I spent some time. I still remember. In oh, Tico, I remember that. Yeah, in Tico, I remember that was oh, part yes, of the yes, yes. Yes. process. Yes. Um, so... You know, um, there were different phases of my life that, you know, where I was kind of, you know, raised up in the fear of the Lord, you know, training up a child in the way he should grow. Mm -hmm. For me, that happened in different phases. It wasn't just under my biological mother, who was the spiritual figure then in the household, although the setting was opposite. You know, God requires the man to be the priest of the house. Yeah. This is which as I've grown up, you know, I've come to understand. And she also, you know, taught us that my dad wasn't very much, much into the things of God. Mm -hmm. You know, time, you know, he was pulled in, you know, my mom with prayers and, you know, years of fasting, yes. you know, finally gave his life to Christ, but still was a baby, you know. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in terms of, you know, who was the spiritual authority, really, my mom was the one who was the spiritual authority. So, that was my upbringing, you know, grew up in a very God-fearing house. And that in itself placed a lot of virtues and values, which have kept me till date. You know, it's one of the things I really give a lot of props to my to my mom, who 
you know, made that sacrifice. You know, she 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 ensured that her children, you know, not just me, my siblings as well, yeah. would get proper, you know, upbringing, you know, and disciplines that she did not compromise on. So that's just a little bit about, you know, my background and, you know, where I was and, you know, I didn't give my life to Christ at an old age where I, you know, experienced a bunch of, you know, like life before Christ. It wasn't really that, you know. So I, I would say you are blessed to not have experienced that because <laughs> it's, there's nothing worth. I had, I, I did that. So there's nothing worth uh, the trauma and all of the healing you have to deal with after that. You're like, oh, Jesus. That's but sincerely, true. you said, I would say your mom, because she was like my big sister in the faith and helped me a lot through my journey as a missionary. Wow. And there's one significant, I remember there were several times when. I would go through some real tough seasons. She was one of those people that you know you could go to and she would, because my mom, uh, yes, they finally accepted that I would do ministry, but it was still not that kind of space where you would go because it felt like I was frustrated. I was That's right. I left everything and I'm saying That's yes right. to God. And all of so she became like that kind of person that you would go and talk to and that she would really understand and just speak truth to you. But I think there's one thing that I would never forget when I was moving to Tico. Uh, I was, I was, I think I was in a missionary in Duala moving to Tico and I was like, God, how do I leave? And she bought my mattress and wow. bought my bed for Tico. If not, I would have slept on the floor. Like that, that, that would never leave my mind. Amazing. Like always, yeah. <laughs> But, but her impact, like you talked about, her impact on the elite, on the elites of Limbe was so significant. I think it shifted the culture of the church, That's right. not just in Limbe, but in Cameroon. That's right. So, because Sonara was one of like the most influential companies in Cameroon, or is. And That's so right. that shifted her, her place that she's the role she has played in the body of Christ is incredible. It's impeccable. And That's right. uh, so we are grateful to her and uh, all that God is using her to do and to did and continue to do okay, so tell us a little you said you moved to the u.s in 2015 yes. tell us a little about that transition yeah so uh 2015 was the year of my first blessing i call it the first blessing because everybody you know especially those from africa or the less developed world mm -hmm. have a dream yeah and if you ask them one of the the top let's say top three things that they might wish for i'm gonna tell you 90 percent of them are gonna say you know i want to travel out of cameroon or out of the country or i want to leave africa you know <laughs> and just like everybody else that was one of my aspirations not something i really fought for a lot but when the mm -hmm. time came you know god was faithful to open the door for me and I will tell you that transition was not as smooth as you would think. Um, I always share this testimony with people. You know, I'm never ashamed to share it because, um, you know, it, it, it helps to boost the faith of a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And those who are trusting in God and, you know, just hoping that, you know, a door would open someday. Yeah. And they can also have an opportunity to you know travel out and you know try to build a, a life you know a better life as they say this is <laughs> the place the land of milk and honey greener pastures people call it whatever they call it <laughs> you know so um for me i had a, a season where i just wrapped up my um, my university studies and i'll not really call it university because it was a, a professional institute which i attended in Douala called um, Akala Institute. The, that's where I did my um, after high school studies. So after you pass your advanced level. So I did not go to the regular university that everybody goes to, but I went to a professional institute. And there I studied um, IT. That's where I really started studying you know, information technology. Um, they, um, they were located, uh, still are located probably in Bonaberry. Okay. And, um, you know, I spent two years there building my foundation in IT. And that was really my first test of, you know, um, uh, being on my own because 
I had to leave my parents' house, which, which I've you know, been around for the longest of time. And this was me really stepping out mm-hmm. into the world. That was my first experience. Again, permit me to just give a little context and tell oh, yeah. you how I appreciate <clears throat> So, um, but that was the beginning of the preparation phases where God was preparing me for the next phase of my journey in life. Not just my walk with God, but my life journey on earth. My moving away, leaving Limbe and going to Douala for school was really where I began to experience life for myself. You know, I began to be exposed to the realities of life. And I'll tell you, it was a big struggle for me, you know, mm-hmm. from believing God for my fees, which was about a, almost a million for that particular school I was attending. And uh, back then, my dad has, had lost his job. He, he was unemployed. And my mom is full time. So where do you get that kind of money from? You know? And uh, this was really the beginning of my faith walk. You know? Um, yes, you want to do the school, but where's the money going to come from? Yeah. You know? And uh, people might say, well, you had relatives, you know, in the diaspora, in the United States, in the UK. Maybe they would help. But uh, we all know that's not the case. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, you know, that's really not the case, you know. Um, so my parents had to do everything they could. My dad, being me being his first son, he, despite the fact that he, you know, had not been doing something, you know, just the fact that I was his first son, he was like, I need to do something for my son. Yeah. This is the one thing I'll do for him that will make him, you know, proud that oh, your dad has done something I need to try. So I saw this man pull out money from I don't know where, you know, wow. he had, and he sat down that day with my mom and said, you know, you know, this is it. This is all I have struggled to save and work for. And I don't wow. remember of money he pulled, but he pulled out an amount of money and told me, he said, this is the school you want to go to. And this is that, that, that. Here you go. Wow. <laughs> know that I'm supporting you, although, you know, it might not be the full, you know, blown sum, but this is everything I have, and I'd save this up for you. And that was a very pivotal moment because our dad has his ways, a very quiet man, and doesn't talk a lot. Sometimes yeah. it's hard for us as a student to understand what his plans were for us or his desires. What he really wanted, we read, we really never do. <laughs> there was that mysterious side of him, which was <laughs> guess. We were just guessing, you know. Yeah. Uh, having studied arts at the level of high school, weren't sure how I was going to transition to a science. Like you say, mm. you want, and how is that going to work? Yeah. Why, the regular UB everybody goes to University of Boya or Yaoundé, but this is what you want to do. And my mom was very convicted. You know, that I was really positive about this. And, you know, of course, the school was expensive. But at some point, they all came to one one accord. Like, probably this is where we should send him to. Yeah. You know? See, you know, what, what happens from there. And although that was a difficult point, but, you know, they did all they could do. My mom, I remember giving me her laptop, which her, her brother sent from the United States. She handed me that one laptop. So everyone their best resource you know wow excel. they were like you know this is what we have for you go you know and excel make us proud it was that kind of that moment mm-hmm. so here am i taking all of these things moving to a strange land i'll call it you know went to i lived in you know bonaberry where i was in a very tiny room i really did not have proper accommodation i got accommodation through the school but uh. i have the full sum accommodation so my bed was on the floor in a tiny room nothing else I just had a mattress my box and that was it so that was the beginning of a new life I'm telling you that room was so cold some nights you know I'll sleep and I'll see centipedes going around some uh. will be leaking and he, that is how bad it was they were I never ever wished for the night time to come because I couldn't call that, you know, a living space. I was, I was always going there to spend the night because I didn't know what I'll experience, you know? 
you know, school time in the afternoons, I'll go to the school, meet my friends, and, you know, we're doing good. But then, you know, my everyday struggle of just having even food to feed myself was tough. So that was one of the times when I really experienced life for myself. You know, I didn't even have, sometimes I would not even have where to get lunch or breakfast, as we we'll call it, or whatever, you know. And, uh, you know, day by day, I'm trusting God every step along the way. It was a faith journey from there. Yeah. And I, where God really started to groom me and build me. Mm -hmm. Me for the now. The life yeah. which I would say was the better life we were all dreaming for to experience here in the United States. So to cut the story short, you know, I struggled a lot during my, you know, my days at, you know, when I was doing my school in, in Douala. And I'm really one dry dude, like, <laughs> you know, struggling. I remember, you know, I used to also go visit the, the, the headquarters, you know, of the ministry, the Seven Ministers Ministry from yeah. over the weekend. I would go there and visit, you know, different people. And uh, the one thing people would do is laugh at me. I'll tell you. They were like, you're so... Oh, wow. I'm telling you. Funny enough, people always laugh at me. You're so dry. Why are you so dry? Why are you so lanky looking all? <laughs> but but they should understand better. Oh, no. It was funny. You, you, you will not believe and you will not believe the people who always laugh at me. You know? <laughs> but oh, my. all of that was a grooming process for me. Yeah. You know? And... Uh, you know, it's just to cut the long story short, after two years of school, and I graduated from that school, um, I couldn't find a job. I couldn't get something to do straight out of school, just like the typical scenario yeah. in Cameroon, where there is very high unemployment, you know, for youths. You need to have some godfather, godmother somewhere to leave, you know, from school to, you know, getting a job. So I decided to improvise, you know, think like an entrepreneur. So I got into, you know, the field of graphic design and printing and doing a lot of marketing products here and there. And that's where, that's what gave birth to text design, which is like my side hustle, the name a lot of people know me by. Text, yeah. call me text a lot. Just because of this initiative, you know, I used to be the, just the designer, creative person. Mm -hmm. So I, I built a, a brand for myself in Douala. And that is how I started to hustle back then. And I started building connection and networks with young entrepreneurs. You know, mm -hmm. one of the people I worked with was uh, Etonde Martin. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. daughter. She's also a very big entrepreneur in, in the Duala space. Now she works with, the, I think, the Turkish consular or something. Now she's like, you know, she holds a very big position there. But then she was an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. She had a, a platform called Cypec, which was a space to give young entrepreneurs uh, exposure. Mm -hmm. The experienced people from the big companies, the big banks like MT and EcoBank. Yeah. And that platform was a place where the young entrepreneurs can mingle with the very top entrepreneurs. Yeah. And that was the first platform that gave me the opportunity to um, mingle and kind of create network with bigger, you know, bigger people in the society. And I started to build a career from there. Yeah. Yeah. If you don't permit me, there's some background noise coming up here. I don't know if that's interrupted. Yeah. Okay. That's fine. Okay. So um, I uh, discussed with my parents and uh, they told me to give one year of my life, you know, as uh, a missionary to God. Like that was like a sacrifice. Mm -hmm. so after my first two years as a student, I did one year of missions, just serving God. Yeah. I was under nobody's agenda. Neither was I under my agenda, but I just submitted myself to know, you know, to serving God under mm -hmm. the missions ministry. I worked at the, um, I think it's the Aqua office, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. Really involved in the Kingdom Business Network. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. so I sat in that office and I just served. I used to live with uh, this couple, the Mungeles. Mungeles, yes. Uh -huh. Christian. Yeah. So my so my mom gave me instruction. Like, this is the couple you live with. You, you stay there, serve them. You do, just see yourself as someone 
who is on a mission to serve. And mm. that was another phase of my life, which was very funny and just so God walked on. <laughs> He worked on me, worked on my person, worked on my character, worked mm. on a lot of things, you know, and this is where I really saw myself growing, you know, um, into maturity, mm. especially when it comes to the things of God, maturing as a believer, you know, and again, my faith was being tested, um, character was being tested, patience, perseverance, you know, all these fruits of the spirit were being birthed during yeah. that one year. And little did I know that God was also preparing me to travel to the States. Yeah. Season. So I served, you know, you know, wholeheartedly, you know, with everything that I could, you know, and the experience in its own is a long story, which I cannot really share here. But, you know, there was just there was just so much, you know, the discipline of waking up in the morning, you know, cleaning, you know, and just serving, you know, people that you don't really know, taking care of their kids and just, and then yeah. as you go to the office, the ministerial office, you sit down there and just wait to serve, take any instruction given to you, you know, when they are, um, you know, conferences or programs, you know, follow the videographer, go do work there, do flyers, just do everything and anything you're told to do. Yeah. I was just someone available to do whatever. Like, I don't know, a freelancer, I don't know what I call myself. But little did I know that in that period, God was preparing me, mm -hmm. you know, to travel out. Because traveling out here, we all know it's, <laughs> well, it's one thing to love to travel, aspire to, but coming here, we know it's a new phase and everybody has a story, you know, mm -hmm. you know, the American story, of, you know, coming here for the first time. So, you know, just to cut the long story short, the Lord prepared me and then uh, the opportunity came, you know, um, an uncle over here who's my mom's brother told me, hey, you know, uh, I would like to apply for school for you here and see, you know, if you can, you know, transition. And we started the process. Mm -hmm. Apply for an F1 visa, which is a student visa for those who don't yep. know. And, uh, you know, then start doing all the paperwork, you know, fill in the visa application, you know, and have all your, um, what they call evidence. <laughs> <laughs> Statements, proof of, you know, that you can sponsor yourself for at least a year. Name it. The story it goes on and on. Make sure you have a sponsor and all that. So I did all of that, gathered all my documents, everything. And uh, there was one big challenge, you know, I needed a sponsor. And usually the advice is the sponsor should be someone directly related to you. Mm -hmm. Put my dad as my sponsor and uh, he had to do my bank statement and everything. And this is the part where I say I'm going to be candid, you know. Yeah. I had a fake bank statement. And it is a very normal thing back home. Yeah, so think that many. Someone was, you know, paid, you know, to do something. And yeah, yeah, was I going to the embassy knowing. <laughs> the thing is this. My dad believed that whosoever he paid to do this did something legit. That, that was his belief. But me being a tech person could tell that this was not a legitimate something. Uh -huh. It wasn't actually done. It just took me a short time to go online and check for a real how a real bank statement looks from that bank and look at the one that I was holding. I just knew that was a joke. So oh, wow. my going to the embassy was a fit walk. And I made a commitment to God. I say, Father, I have served you, you know, and I reminded him of just the sacrifices that I've made. And I'm like, if it's just really you opening this door for me, then I know that this is not a limitation. Whatever I have here is just me doing my due diligence, but I know you're the one who opens doors. And yes. And that mindset. You know, I didn't tell too many people, and a lot of people didn't know I was traveling, but the few people I spoke to really discouraged me. They are like, ah, these days when you go to the embassy, they're like... I'm telling you, and you're going for like a student, uh, they're like, just forget about it. <laughs> you, you don't even stand a chance, you know. But oh, wow. 
about it. I'm telling you. But I knew inside that God had said it was time. Mm. I feel like there was no iota of doubt, despite knowing the situation, you know. And I remember um, going for the day of my interview. This is where I transitioned to really tell the, the miracle worked. The Lord instructed me to sow a seed into then, you know, the, 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 the work that I was under, which was a, a, now Bishop Victor Balinga. I served under his church all the time. So I used to get the keys with this church. So that was then the ministry that I was a part of. Yeah. He instructed me to sow a seed, you know. You know, I've been faithful in my time and, you know, everything, but the Lord instructed me to sow a seed specifically for this, you know, um, what I'm about to go and, you know, experience, which is, you know, going to interview, you know, mm -hmm. to his wife, you know, um, uh, 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 Mama Dorothy Balinga. And I told her, I told her, you know, she was in Yawunde. So while I was going to get ready for the interview, I just went there gave her the seat and I told her, this is it. This is what's happening. I'm about to go to the interview, to the, the embassy to interview for this, you know, and, you know, yeah. I'm positive. I told her I'm traveling. I wasn't like, you know, I'm going to see if, you know, I said, I'm traveling to the States. So <laughs> I'm the Lord. Yeah, to, that's what faith, how faith speaks. Yeah. So I gave her the seat and she prayed over me and that was it. Funny thing, it wasn't my mom who prayed over me or my dad, it was the person that the Lord instructed me to go to, yeah. sow the seed. And that's exactly what I did, you know? Everybody else was just like, good luck, you know? Go and try your luck, <laughs> you know? Go and see. So, you know, this is where the miracle happens. On the day of the interview, you know, just like everybody, that place is like heaven's gates, you know? Like, <laughs> tension there is like, you don't know if they're calling your name next. Are you going in or out? Are you being rejected? But it's a funny place where you go, there is sorrow and there is laughter. You see people crying and coming out, others jumping. So it's, you know, the only term I can use is like, probably that's like a judgment space. You know? <laughs> that place is just one space. I mean, there is no space like that place. The, American, the U.S. Embassy in Cameroon. It's something else. So, you know, I go and they do all the checks, you know, you have to check out your phone, keep all of that on the side go to issue you a number, you hand in your documents. I don't know, probably the process has changed, but you hand in your documents, they give you a number and you go sit down and you're there waiting for your number to pop up. And while you're seated there, there's a screen right in front of you playing a video. They have some kind of drama video they acted on like, um, you know, different families come in, you know, they're like, oh, they act a video where, you know, uh, someone came to the embassy with a fake document and like you're rejected. I'm telling you, the video is designed, it's a psychological video designed to tell everybody sitting there that if you came ready to lie, just tell the truth. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is the purpose of that video played there. For the while you're sitting there, it's a, it's a drama video playing. Uh -huh. Just someone whose parents did, you know, a fake thing, they went to the embassy and this, they got denied. That is the purpose of that video. So all the while I'm sitting there and I'm just like, God, you know, <laughs> this is me and you here. You know, I'm not even paying attention to that, but just for the sake of this story, which I am unfolding, and I can encourage someone, you know, to not rely on, you know, the Bible says trust in the Lord with all you had and lean not on your understanding. I'm telling you, there were all reasons for me to lean on the circumstances that surrounded me. There were a lot of pointers and a lot of things which the enemy put in the way to tell me that, my friend, this is not going to work. But I trusted God with my everything, mm -hmm. you know. And behold, my time came. I was called, you know, to the, to the interview window. And uh, this was this American lady, you know, because the interviewers are, oh, they're Americans. Now, the people who check your documents are Cameroonians, so they know everything. They know the system. They know the ins and outs. They know what you're submitting there, what's good and what's bad. Yeah. So I pull, I, you know, walk up to the window. There is this American lady there. I clearly remember she had a black jacket on with the, the tones, you know, the design, just, you know, silver tones. Yeah, I remember okay. that day, you know, blonde. 
hair lady, you know, and she's like, hi, you know, and then we start the interview. And, you know, she has my documents there in front of her, you know, my passport there with a sticky note on it, you know, and then she's interviewed. And she asked me all the questions, you know. So, you know, what's your name? You know, I introduced myself to her. So you're going to study in the States, yes. What are you going to study? I tell her, you know, they ask you what school are you going to study in? You know, give that answer. Like, ask what other schools, you know, did you research about? Luckily enough, I knew of a few other schools which we had applied to. Uh -huh. you know? So I was able to tell them, you know, and they were like, okay, that's good. Like, okay, they asked now, who is your sponsor? You know, I said, my dad is my sponsor and my dad and myself have the same names. My dad gave me all his names. So uh -huh. my sponsor is my dad's name and my name is same as my dad's name. So yeah. So she was like, oh, so you and your dad, are, you know, same name. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, okay. They're like, so where does your sponsor work? You know, so I, I told her, you know, then my dad just did a contract you know, with the third party. So that was what we put on there. But really the contract had ended, you know, it wasn't active. So I was like, <laughs> she was like, okay, that works here. Yeah. Okay, that's that's good. So, um, you know, um, ask me where you're gonna stay and ask all of these questions. And while she was asking me these questions, she asked the questions ended, just like you're interviewing me now, mm -hmm. and looped back to a, to a specific question. She asked, who did your bank statements? Okay, so I said, my dad did my bank statements. She skipped, she, she asked other questions and came back to that question. She said, oh, so, so you said, who did your bank statements? The question came up the second time. When she asked that question, then see what happened. My eyes fell on her desk. On her desk were my documents, which I submitted with my passport. And my passport was a sticky note. And on the sticky note was written fake bank statements, which I could read. And the second uh -huh. thing I could read because the paper was facing her. So I'm sitting uh -huh. like that way. The passport is there. The sticky note is on the passport. And on the passport is written fake bank statements. And there was something else I was reading which I couldn't read. Oh my. When my eyes fell on that, my heart sunk. But then there was a second thing in me that told me, maintain your composure, keep your smile, face the interviewer, and just keep talking like you didn't see anything. I'm telling you, Auntie Velma. When this lady asked that question, all of that happened. My eyes fell on it. And when she looked back and asked, the, repeated the question, who did you say did your bank statement? I told her my dad did my bank statement with a smile on my face. And I just maintained eye contact with her. And she looks down. She looks at her computer screen. She looks down and she's looking at the passport with the, the, the message written on there. Yeah. And she pauses for a while, like nothing being said. I'm standing there looking. I probably know what's about to happen because I've read. Yes. I've read it clearly. Like, man, you, you're busted, right? You're probably <laughs> the one who's about to leave this place crying like heaven's gates, right? <laughs> you, just, you just know what's about to happen. And here comes the miracle. And that's why I never, ever, lose my trust in God. I have an yeah. experience and a walk with him. Each time I go through life, life issues and challenges, mm -hmm. I, remember, I look back and see what he, he, he has yes. done. Auntie Velma, this lady peeled off the sticky note from the passport, twisted it, threw it in the trash under her desk and stamped, gave me a visa approval, gave me, there's usually a paper that it give you yes. a great uh -huh. approved that she told me, congratulations, you know, you've been approved for your visa. Go and go and give your passport there, they're gonna stamp it and then you come and collect it the next day. Wow. Yes. Wow. That is my, that is the first concrete experience, testimony, miracle. I knew that yes, this God that we serve, 
he exists. He is true to his word. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm going to interrupt you a little. I think there are two things that you shared that I think there are like, key principles that are so significant. Yes. I think the one is a principle of service. Okay, that's and, right. And, and I think people forget, you know, there are times when God, the Bible says God is a faithful rewarder of those who diligently serve mm -hmm. him. Diligently like, serve yes. Who might, well, who might serve God in a certain place and expect the reward from them, but God has it in another place. Absolutely. And what, what we do it with all of our heart, God is like, I'm watching you, I'm seeing you, I'm going to show up when it's time to reward. And, and you talk about the seed, that the fact that God spoke to you to take a seed and so, and you obeyed that, I think that was so key to unlock it. I remember in the first time I came to the US, I just came to visit for a conference. Yeah. I've gone to interpret in a, in, a, in a conference, it was in Liberia, and they needed a French interpreter. And I've been fasting that time. And so after the, before the conference started, the Lord told me to go empty my bank account and take it to a particular minister who was not my pastor. I'd never attended his service. I knew, I knew he was one of the fathers in the land, but I never like, mm -hmm. but I knew I heard the Lord clearly. I heard his name. So I went to the bank, emptied my account and went to his church and I saw him walking up. I said, sir, good morning. And I introduced myself. I said, the Lord asked me to bring this to you. Mm. It was the next week that I went to that conference to interpret. And the very first day of the conference, the facilitators who come said, Velma is the best interpreter. She must go with us to the US. Wow. Like, <laughs> I went for an interview. The lady was, she saw that I was a Cameroonian. She had lived to the Cameroonian in the US. And she didn't wow. interview me. She was like, oh, my roommate was a Cameroonian. You're going for a conference. I'm excited. And it was a conversation. Yes. And she said, congratulations. Yes. And then the second time when I was coming as a student, similar thing. Wow. And, and I think as believers, at times we forget that God is a God of principles. Yes. There are some things that God will ask somebody to do, and it sounds foolish and crazy. Yeah. It sounds like you're wasting your time, but God is like, I'm setting you up for something good. If you That's just right. obey and trust me, yeah, man. That's awesome. Well said. And, well said. Yeah. That's it. Yes. Thanks so, for sharing, man. That's so good. That's so good. Hope that inspires someone. So what would you tell someone who is getting ready to transition to the diaspora, who is planning, who is wanting to... Maybe yeah. they're getting ready to go to the embassy or they already have a visa. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, I believe your platform is, you know, visible to all audiences. Believers, yes. non-believers, people who know God as people that know God. And the hope here is that, you know, all that, you know, get to watch your, you know, your, your videos will be touched yes. and will experience God or come to the faith or come to the knowledge of Christ in one way or the other. Mm -hmm. So yes. when, I, when I'm answering my questions, I'm careful to not be biased, <laughs> to be like, Okay, what, what what advice do you have for, let's say, a deliverer coming? No, for anyone. Yeah. Reasons being that uh, there is a common denominator to all who dwell on this earth, uh, call them to mankind. There's a common de denominator. And the Bible says it causes the rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Yep. And there's also the time and chance it's the equilibrium that, you know, it's a common denominator to all. The, 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 the how, how you make use of your time is directly proportionate to the opportunities that might come your way. And oh, the that outcome is so of good. Those opportunities. That is so good. Now I'm going to jump and holler. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, to someone preparing, you know, to travel, I would say spend time to build yourself. If you still have some time and build yourself, not just in one area, you know, career wise, make sure that you have something going on. You have a skill, you have, um, you know, um, um, or be it, you know, the, 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 the secular education or professional education 
just make sure that you have something that you've nurtured and built and that you know that this is like a staff in my hand. This is like, you know, a tool yes. that can, you know, be used to, you know, do something productive or lucrative because one thing at the embassy is they're always looking for people who are ambitious or who have a skill so that when they come to the States, they are not a burden that yeah. they can contribute and add value to the system. I will tell you that is one thing for sure they always look at. Mm -hmm. Are you traveling as an empty head or you, you're someone that can add value? That's why now I heard they put a restriction of you must have a certain level of degree or something before they, even if you win the lottery, you must be a, I think an advanced level holder or something. They've put some minimum requisites. That's good. Yeah. So that's just a general tip, you know, don't just spend time, you know, while you're there, just wandering around, you know, build a skill, you know, and have um, some, some proof that you've been doing this thing, a certificate, yeah. or whatever, you know, that can prove and that can attest, you know, that's why in the States, they always ask for recommendations. Why is that everywhere you go to, they're like, we need a letter of recommendation, at least three or five of them. Like, what's the whole point of recommendations? Because they want to know your public face. Like, how do people perceive you out there? Are you someone who adds value? Are you a troublemaker? Or can people yeah. attest? Or the environments that you've been a part of, the spaces, the job sites, or the organizations, can they attest that you, you are someone who adds value to that space? I can tell you that's one criteria that they always look at. So if you're preparing yourself to travel, take education serious, take training serious. And yeah. for believers, there's always a season that God sets aside to prepare you. Now, for some people, it can be year long seasons. For me, it was, I can remember, it will be the three years of my life when I left my parents' home and, you know, I was just on my own. That was when, you know, the Lord started to prepare me. And despite it being, a, a season of where I was being prepared unconsciously. I didn't know that this is what he was yeah. doing. And it was kind of an unconscious, you know, preparation, but, you know, I took it serious, you know, and I did not, you know, take it for play, you know, and uh, I believe that that alone, take every little thing, be faithful in little, you know, the scripture that says, you know, if you're faithful in little things, then God will entrust you with more. I, yeah. I see it in that light. So, Anyone preparing, whatever you're doing, if you're going to sell, just sell to the best of your ability, you know. If you're overseeing a small crowd, a business, or an initiative, a project, do it faithfully. Mm -hmm. Because in so doing, you know, God is preparing you for your next season, for your next level. You know, if you're, if you're serving under someone, serve wholeheartedly. As you said, don't look to be rewarded immediately because God is certainly a, a, a great rewarder and he knows how to reward you well, you know. So, you know, that's that. That's my advice to everybody out there. You know, God gives a fair opportunity to everyone. He's the God of mercy. He's the God of second chances to both believers and unbelievers. Keep doing what you're doing. Do yeah. it you know, and make sure that you, you develop, you know, that spirit of excellence in everything you do. So that's nice. Man, thank you so much. That's so incredible because I've seen young people put their lives. I don't know. I think I've left Cameroon for so long, but in Liberia, I've seen young people put their lives on the pause because they want to travel abroad. Yeah. Like, keep living, keep living. studying, keep doing, like, put your hands to work, do something, do that's something. Right. I see. <laughs> Let, let me throw yeah. one thing in there. Let me throw one thing in there. I actually have a plan right before I traveled to start a digital print press. Mm -hmm. And I, I traveled to the States with that business plan. I had a whole business plan. I mean, if I did not travel, that was what I wanted to do, to yeah. set up a, a digital print house, you know. And, you know, I already had a few financial partners here and there. And, you know, all of those things I took with me to them, was, it's funny, like, I took all those business plans, everything I've been doing, you know? So, yeah. I mean, who knows? I'm not saying that any of that played a part. I know God was the one who, in his own mercy, you know, mm -hmm. opened that door for me. But these are things that, again, when any person who is, you know, in their right senses sees, they know that this person 
needs an opportunity. Like, no, you're doing, you're, you're too good that we need to give yes. you a chance. Kind of, you know, so never blow that. Never blow that opportunity. Yeah. Yes. That's yes. awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one more question. When, when, when oh, now focus particularly on young people, not say young believers. When at times when, and it doesn't happen to everybody, but I've seen quite a few when yeah. the Christian travels uh, to the US or somewhere in the diaspora, at times life just gets tough that their faith gets shipwrecked. I actually have several in my community that we have been back and forth on. What can you tell them? How can somebody who comes in, they are a believer, they, are, they used to love Jesus, how can they come and stay faithful and stay consistent with their work with God even with all the challenges around? Mm. That's a very good question and a very tough one. And I relate very much to that because um, the majority of young people that travel from Africa to the United States all have, you know, uh, the challenge of assimilation and just becoming part of the system. There is always a struggle, you know, especially when you come and, you know, with the mentality of, you know, our African brothers, usually a lot of people can testify that when they travel, they got help from strangers or people who are not directly related to them, other than the ones who they know or yeah. In, 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 in my case, in fact, that was my situation. But, you know, not to take us shift away from that question, you know, one of the very first things is traveling to the United States or having the opportunity to travel out is a test for every believer. And I can mm -hmm. call it the test of the first blessing. This is proof that you really are a believer, you really love God. Like, when the blessing comes, do you straight away and get carried away by the blessing and forget about the giver of the blessing. It's it's really the first test. It's really not something of, you know, um, why do they, that means they were never really, mm. you, know, or, uh, you know, people who loved God. I'll just put it that way. You're like, it's a test. Traveling to the States is God opening a door and seeing that now that I've opened or given this child, one first big blessing. Let me see what he does. Is he going to still love me the way he, you, he, he, he used to? Is he still going to spend time with me? Or is he going to be carried away? Mm -hmm. That is my view and my perspective. But again, we know that we are humans and we have we are different levels of maturity with God. Some people travel and, you know, they travel at the stage where they are a little mature. Yeah. Some yeah. people might be, you know, on fire for God and they are all busy, but it doesn't mean they are mature. Let's not mistake my activity and busyness in the things of God for maturity. <laughs> Very important, I'm telling you. Yeah. They might have been the one you knew, the best interpreters, the best singers, the best whatever, but really they are not matured. In the, they are not matured when it comes to the, their work and their relationship with God. So... When they are being tested through the blessing, which is traveling to the States, that would be one of the proofs that this person had not really matured in their work with God because the blessing or the hardship, however you see it, because the package of traveling is a mixed one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a blessing and it can be a curse. There are some people who would say, I wish I did not travel. When they come in, they're like, I rather had stayed back home. At some point in their life, in their challenge, they, they would say words like that, you know, because the way I'm suffering, I, I just wish I was back home. There are people who have suffered in this country, still struggling yeah. with papers after many years, and they are walking under the, you know, hidings, and they, just, they don't just know how to go about life, you know. Yeah. It's like, I just wish I was back home, you know. And some people, you know, are really, are really there. And for me in particular, not to be, to sugarcoat anything, I had my fair share of such experiences. You know, although by the grace of God, I'm standing, doesn't mean that my faith wasn't challenged. Yeah. Because yeah. I remember at some point, I really drifted away from the faith. I will tell you, I drifted away. But one of the keys, you know, as I said, would be, you know, don't cut away the spiritual links that you had established, you know, especially spiritual authorities and 
spiritual peers, those that God has put you with friends that, you know, were believers, they might still be in Cameroon. Doesn't mean because you've traveled, you should cut away from them and be like, oh, now I'm at a different level, you know, I no longer communicate with these people. But for me personally, I did not break my spiritual relationships, you know, mm-hmm. be it mentorship, you know, be it, you know, uh, those above, those, you know, who are at, you know, vertical, horizontal, you know, spiritual relationships. But I did not break that because those people have to keep you in check. They remind you from time to time. When you give them the opportunity, they'll always throw those words out there. I hope yeah, you're still yeah. praying. I hope you found a place of, you know, worship. You know, that's one of the things too. You know, when you come, one of the first things is to connect yourself with the family. You know, we are the church of Christ. So when you leave from one place to another, you must look for the nearest, and that should be the first thing that comes to mind. Find a place, a family of faith that you can join, you know, and so that the fire would yeah. not be quenched, you know, you can be kept, you know, in check, and, you know, someone can continue speaking over you. Again, that will boil down to the level of maturity. Some people can come here and wait for God to speak before the move. Others will need to come and immediately find a place. Mm. a church or something to go if not they would just the fire would just die down and before you know it the challenges that they face would even drag them away you know yeah. because yeah. this is the land of milk and honey it's like it's like the new babylon if you come you'd be sucked away by the activities and the way of life or the issues of life will come in the way and it to be like you know yeah, yeah. so I don't know if that answered the question, but yes, that that does. Thank you so much. Yes, it's it's so. I think for me, maybe it was easy because I came in as a sem- as a missionary, so I came in to just get more training as a pastor. That's right. And, uh, you were still always, part, you know, always been in body. spaces. That's where, right. Yeah. That right. That confined alone has a way to to guard you. Yeah. It's, it's one of the ways of when the Bible says, "Guard your heart." When you're around mm-hmm. people that, you know, nurture the faith or, you know, iron sharpened, iron kind of people, there's a way to stay. Like you're connected to the branch, you know, mm-hmm. the vine, you know. But when you are not around that kind of circle, you, you're, you're like a branch disconnected from the vine and it's not being fed. And mm-hmm. without you noticing it, you're withering. Slowly, you might not know. Before you know yeah. others outside see that you're withering. <laughs> You might not notice that. You might not notice, yes. But you know it, you're just completely cut off. Yeah. So stay connected. That's awesome. Yes. Yeah, thank you, yes. Uh, so when we come, I, 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 have a, I have a conviction, and I might be wrong, that yeah. God doesn't put believers in any place for nothing. That's right. Whether it's in their offices, whether it's, and I believe that if God brings a believer to this country, he has a mission, he has a That's plan, right. he has a purpose. Yes, right. for us to make money, get wealth, but at times it's far beyond. He has a mission that is bigger. That's how right. can how can Christians, because I've listened to you and I think you live that well. So how can Christians who come to the U.S. embrace their missional assignment? They don't have to be pastors like me, but how can they embrace their missional assignment and live that in a way that glorifies God while they still thrive in whatever jobs they do and all of that? That's right. Um, that's a good question, Antibelma. Uh, it's important to know um, that our God is a God of, you know, the, 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 the beginning and the end. He, he utters our life. The Bible says he's author and finisher, you know. And um, his, his word also says that he has given us all things that pertains to life and godliness. Life. Mm-hmm. Life and godliness. Yeah, yeah. These two things, sometimes as believers, we we separate them. Mm. But, you know, God's intent is for us to thrive holistically and to excel, to be above and not beneath in every space of influence that he puts us. Yeah. When he says go into the world, the world doesn't just mean the globe of the earth. It means the space that he has called you into. He shaped all of us and called us into different spaces and spheres of influence, you know. Um, outside of just, you know, the fivefold ministry gifts, there are other areas 
you know, that he has called people into, you know, helps. Some people are just, you know, passionate, you know, seeing others, you know, um, 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 succeed. Some are mentors, some yeah. are good teachers, you know. We've been called into different spaces. And God, that is called our world. That is your world. So you cannot isolate yourself from that space. So when the Bible yeah. says go yeah. into all the world, it literally means even the space that, you know, he has designed for you to be a part of. Yeah. Go yeah. there, be the head there, you know, excel there, dominate there, have dominion there, everything like that. Mm -hmm. And I like to use the example of Joseph, you know. Joseph was one of those that was called out, you know, from, you know, um, a household. And God's, God predestines our lives. So he has written everything out. And the destiny of Joseph was to become, you know, um, the, the, was it the governor or the prime minister? I'm not sure. Yeah, the prime, prime, minister of Egypt. prime minister of Egypt. But um, the, the process to get in there didn't really paint a picture of that end goal. You know, but the Lord had showed him visions of all, oh, you know, the stars and the stars bowing down to him in the middle and all that. And for many of us, um, the Lord has weaved our lives in such manner where the end goal is for you to really excel in a certain space, to lead, to lead institutions, to lead governments, or to lead, you know, different circles, you know, be it in the circular space, you know, and again, the reason why I said life and godliness is because we like to separate. We feel like believers cannot thrive in other spaces, in government, yeah. Congress, in the White House, in um, uh, the, the presidential house, in camera, wherever we call it, you know, in yeah. government, you know. And all these different areas, we are still, we are now beginning to see that, hey, we are not just called to the four corners of the mm -hmm. church, you know, the building. We are the church and we are called to go into yeah. the world which is all these different spaces. Yeah. So just the same way we pay attention as believers to build our, you know, our faith, build ourselves in our faith, we don't have to forget about, you know, the, you know, um, uh, the, the, the areas that the Lord has, you know, called us to be in. He has molded us to be in all these different spaces. You know, just like the Hebrew boys, the Bible says David had a spirit of excellence. Everywhere he went to, you know, he operated with that spirit of excellence. You know, he was an advisor to the king. You know, why was he able to have such? If you look at, if you translate his job to present day, that's like an advisor to the president, right? Yeah. Where, you know, he was able to interpret. Oh, Daniel, is it Daniel? I'm sorry, I'm, am I mixing? Who interpreted the king uh, and Nebuchadnezzar? Joseph dream? interpreted the dream. Did, okay, Joseph of, interpreted the dream. Potiphar. Of, of Potiphar. <laughs> Yeah, but there was also the... the Daniel the interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's. Yes, Daniel interpreted Nebuchadnezzar, who had to slay all his, um, uh, his uh, whatever, his advisors, yeah. witches and wizards. Uh -huh. And Daniel was able to go seek God's face. You know, um, and he, you know him and his friends, you know, were, were called into the king's palace as, you know, people of excellence. You know, they were yeah. trained there to become advisors, like, you know, the top people. So... When we look at these little stories in the Bible, we see that children of God were not living isolated lives, like just being missionaries or pastors or this. No. They carried these offices of pastor, bishop, whatever, to the world, and they lived as those, you know, um, those called, you know, in the fivefold ministry gifts, but in these spaces of influence. Yes. yes. And that is, the, that is how my mind has been shaped. You know, being part of a, 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 a mission, which is, you know, the, the, the ministry I'm currently a part of, which the Lord instructed me. Again, my journey with him has been that way. He always tells me the next phase, the next mission you're going to support. So I've always seen myself like that. When I come, when I came here, you know, he, he pointed me to a mega church called the, the Bridge View, where there I served as, you know, the pianist, you know, okay. I was played second keys. And while I was serving there, he tested me and told me now, you know, I want you to go help a dying church, which was a Baptist church called the Second Baptist Church. Uh -huh. We were about to crash. This is while I was studying. So I was in school studying computer networking security, and I was struggling. 
I did not have money to pay my fees. I was an F1 student. As an, as an F1, you're not permitted to work. Yep. You can only work 20 hours on campus and they pay you minimum wage, like $8 something. What can they do? What I can pay? <laughs> Not, you can't even buy your, I know your, that. your first week, you know what I mean? So, you know, you have a rent of like, you know, $1,000. You have school fees of like $3,000, you know, and you're struggling to make ends meet. So here am I, here am I trying to, you know, find an opportunity. Maybe I'll be part of this ministry and they'll support me one way or the other. You know, I'm sorry about the noise. So okay. I start serving here and... The Lord tells me, go to this smaller church and help them. The, the church is crumbling. And I was left in a quandary where I was like, yeah. okay, so help me here. And this big mega church, they had three services. They were going to pay me to play for all three services. Meanwhile, the dying church was a dying <laughs> church. Of course, they can't give you nothing. So I go to this church. They said they have a service from 10 to 12, which is when the other church has the second service. But they, they said, you're either playing for us all three services or you're not playing. Oh, wow. And I knew God was putting me to a test again. Yes, yes. And he told me, you know where I want you to be? Huh. I'm like, so how do I afford to take care of myself? It was simple. You know where I want you to be and that was it. And and to Velma, here am I, I went to this Baptist church and served there, earning nothing. I didn't know how I was going to pay my fees. During my first term, I dropped out. Oh, wow. Thank you, yeah. During my first term, I dropped out. And I dropped out, and summer in the United States, international students are not required to be full-time. That's yeah. the only time you can be part-time. So I dropped out and found myself something did something, volunteer, whatever. And I met this guy who was introduced to me through the intern pastor in the dying church. They had an intern pastor. Now, yeah. this intern pastor was a major businessman in the community. He was a pastor, and he was the principal of one of the high schools, I think elementary school, sorry. So this guy was a businessman. He was a pastor, and he was also the principal of the school. I was like, this is amazing. I've not seen this yeah. before. This is different, you know. And this man introduces me to the reason why I'm, I'm telling you the story is still part uh -huh. of answering the question. And I hope that you know viewers and listeners can catch what I'm really trying to say here. Yeah. Because the question again is how do you thrive in different spaces while still serving God? You know? Yeah. And that's what I'm really trying to explain. Mm -hmm. I never really treated them as two separate things. Because God has called us to go into the world. And when you're going into the world, you are going as this person who has built himself in the area in which the gift of God are putting you or whatever you're good at doing. Yep. You've nurtured it. You've gone to the best institutions. You've done everything to develop that gift yeah. to the best, you know, yeah, because being above and not beneath, all those things, we just confess them, but we forget it's that. Not talk. It's not talk. It takes some working. It takes a lot has to go. You know, you need to give yourself to training. You need to give yourself to different aspects, you know, mentorship. So you mm -hmm. develop yourself to become someone who is then considered excellent. Mm -hmm. Like People look there like you want this person just like yourself. You, you, you developed your interview, your uh, translation skill to the point where people can look at you like, we want you. Yeah. If you did not take time to build this gift and nurture it, would, would you be the head? Would you be a preferred candidate? The answer is no. <laughs> yep. <laughs> that, are not the tale. that would not be your reality. It would yeah. be a and never translate to your reality. Mm. As children of God, we must know that. We must know that there is the part of walking out, you know, and building yourself, giving yourself to training and building, you know, your, your gifts, you know. Mm. Build. And there is the aspect of God now using you as a vessel that has been walked on and is ready to be shown to the world. Now that will shine brighter and brighter and brighter. But 
if if you are not someone who has given himself to training and preparation, then there is no shining. Yes. <laughs> and shine brighter and brighter. So for me, you know, just to wrap things up, I do not treat this these two things as a separate thing. Hmm. While walking with God, I was also nurturing and building my gift and the skills he has given me, you know, and, you know, in the secular space or however you want to term it and call it. I made sure that I kept excelling and, you know, walking in that spirit of excellence, yep. building that skill, you know, Moses, God had to take him through the process of him going to the king's palace. There he was built and trained as the prince. Mm -hmm. All those things. And that's the scenario. You can see it in the life of Moses. You can see it in Joseph. You can see it in Daniel. You see it in all these characters in the Bible. And it's the same thing. Yeah. God, through all these institutions, which we call secular, or institutions of Jezebel, whatever we call them. <laughs> through all of this. of Jezebel. Because everything now is Jezebel. The system is Jezebel. Oh, my. I didn't know that one. <laughs> yes, we know that, well, America has a Jezebel system, however you call it, you know, that fights or the gates of hell, that fight against the kingdom of darkness. But really, the strategy that God has designed in order to overcome this world, you need to pass through it. And he will pass you through the systems so that then you can be the head over it because you understand the ins and outs of it. You know, if not, the church will keep being ineffective. We'll keep praying, but we'll see no change. We'll have no voice. And, you know, the coming will be delayed because the church is not taking its rightful place. So if I am the church, I must be excellent in my sphere of influence so that there I can be the head and I can bring the gospel and people will see me as a respectable somebody who understands what they're saying in all as we like, no, let's listen to this guy. Yeah. He knows what he's saying in this area, in that area. So why yeah. not? This, you know, so th that is my reasoning. And that's how God has groomed me. You know, make sure that you don't put aside the skill that I showed you from the time you were in Cameroon. You've loved computers. He says, build that skill and become excellent at it. Be the very best at it. And mm -hmm. I've never put that to the side. Even That's why even when I came here and I was struggling, relatives were like, leave school and go and hustle. Go and walk under the table. Why are you trying to do school? Like others come, they go fire for asylum. You at the school. I said, no. I will suffer and go through the school. God will open doors for me. I will continue. I'm not dropping out of school. And that's the focus I maintained. And God helped me through it. To go through my education in IT while still serving him full time. I, there was never a division to that. Never, ever. I'm telling you, Auntie Velma. Auntie Velma you know, and I saw God walked in and through it. You know, there was a time when, I'll tell you a funny story, I was about to be, I, I don't know call it, exfiltrated or repatriated or sent <laughs> There was a time I was about to be sent back to Cameroon because this is what happened. I got caught illegal here during that season where God told me to go serve in this church and everything. That's my second major testimony. The first one was the embassy one. This was the second major one that happened to me. When God told me to leave the big platform, the big church, the place that they said, they're going to pay me $500 every time I play, whatever. Mm -hmm. Struggling, owing fees. I dropped out and it's first, I did first term, then summer came. So I was permitted not to attend summer, but I was owing for first term. So I couldn't even register for the next term. But I said, yes. I took care of that. So that was my situation. And one of the guys that I traveled with, who was my friend, came from Cameroon. They knew both of us as Cameroonians. He had run away and went to another city and filed for asylum there. So they already had eyes on us like, this guy's. Oh. I told this from school already, like, these people, from, we should keep an eye on them. So they were kind of putting an eye on us, on, I'll say on me, because this friend of mine had run away. He's up, yeah. They ran away and he was somewhere. And so that was the case. So yeah, my, I met this guy who was a convict, then I didn't know. He had gone to jail, spent time in jail. Came out of jail and started a life for his own. He started he started a business because he couldn't work for anybody. You know how the system is when yeah. you're, you're messed up. You're, you're credit, credentials. <laughs> so this guy, I wouldn't mention his name just for you know for the sake of you know his privacy. So 
I started working with him. He was doing construction. And I started doing construction work here in America, which I'd never done back home. Tough work. I have pictures which remind me of my work and my experience with God here. So times That's when the I was, thing I missed for some jobs I did that I didn't take pictures. Maybe I was yeah. just, I, I think I was, it was so humbling that I didn't want to remember. Oh my God. I took pictures. <laughs> I took pictures because I had to remember. And those were the days that I, I wished I was, I didn't come to America. Those were the days I suffered. This guy will hire one person, me, and will do the job that 20 people can do just because he wants to save money and he was paying me under the table and minimum wage. So that was some of the periods of my struggle. And during that time, the Lord assigned a lady. I don't know if we're still in time or out of time. Should I continue? Yeah, we're good. We're, we're good. good. We don't have time limit. Okay. We just, Lord, we just talk. Okay. So the Lord instructed the lady, um, and I'll mention her name because she's like my sister, Barbara Hansen. And she worked at the school, the, 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 the community college that I attended then. And, you know, she just had a heart to help, you know, Africans, people from Cameroon in particular. So she understood my situation. We talked and she took me in. She talked with her kids and she took me into her home and I lived with oh, them. Wow. Because I was struggling, they had to kick me out of, you know, the apartment I was in. I couldn't pay for it. You, you know how the story goes. So I lived with Barbara then. Barbara knew my situation and, you know, she felt compassion for me. She took me in. So I was part of her family. We were like family, you know. Um, and then she um, was just, uh, she had divorced and she was just her and her kids. And little did I know that she was going through thoughts of suicide. Oh, and the no. Lord, although she was helping me, the Lord had also brought me into her life to help her. So while at her oh, home, we started, yes. yeah, so while at her home, we started a Bible club called Power Team. And the Lord used that to strengthen her. And that was when she opened up to me and what was going on. And she said, Emmanuel, I've never seen someone like you. Despite the things you're going through, you don't know how you're going to pay your fees. And you keep telling me how you, you're trusting God. You, you have faith. And when she saw the way I handled myself, despite the challenge I was facing, she didn't see a reason for, for her to have the thoughts she was having. Like, then yes. why I giving up on life when... When I look at someone like you, you just make me feel encouraged and empowered. Mm. That's how God used me to, you know, brought me into a life as, you know, writing her own story. Yeah. I was very instrumental. And she was also very instrumental, you know, in my life. And I remember Amen. how when um, this scenario happened where the guy I was working for, you know, took me out on a break. We were at a subway. That was during summer period when I dropped out of school and, you know, I wasn't enrolled. And mm -hmm. we came across the, the, the lady in charge of international affairs who had been looking for us, came face to face, to face with Emmanuel and his boss. <laughs> I was looking oh, all, my! I was looking all messy in an overall, you know, just like how construction workers look. Yeah. And she was like, hey, Emmanuel, we haven't seen you in a long time. Where have you been? <laughs> What's going on? Like, can you tell me why, why are you looking like this? And this lady being so forward and nosy kept asking me all these questions. And while I was about to answer some formulated lie, tell her that I was volunteering and stuff, <laughs> God forgive me. The guy who was my boss came in and like, who is this lady like inter interrogating someone who is my employee, not knowing anything about oh, me. Oh no. <laughs> So the guy immediately rushed out, like, why are you asking him so many questions? He walks for me as soon as he as soon as he mentioned that. Oh no. The whole scene at the subway was so dramatic. Everything changed. And mind you, this was the period in America where a lot of people were being repatriated. There was like the yes. whole ice. Do you know about the whole ice thing? Ice. Yes. Uh -huh. it, was ice. it was that period, you know, where any little thing you're gone, you're really what's the name? Wow. So, um, um, so he, you know, he came and tried to defend me, not knowing he was doing more harm than good. And the lady answers, what? Did you say he works and he works for you? And the lady starts going off there. That do you know that what you're doing right now, talking to the guy, can end you, can end you in jail because he's working illegally? The guy hears jail. And he immediately snaps because, as I told you, uh -huh. 
So then I didn't know. So when he snaps, and I'm trying to understand at the heat of the moment what was going on. Yeah. He's, saying this, he's saying that. He pulls me to the back, like, what's going on? Like, because he had jail. That's when he told me about his background. And I'm yet speechless and confused. <laughs> Not knowing what to do. This lady had told me, come to the office tomorrow. We're terminating your I-20 and we're sending you back. That's wow. how mean this lady was. She was like, make sure you come with your guardian. So that's how the thing played out. It was a very dramatic something. So after the guy, I explained things to him. I told him I'm a foreign exchange student. He did not understand all of that. He's like, I yeah, it's a, many people don't understand. Yeah, people don't understand it. He was like, I don't care. That lady was really mean to you. She has no right to talk to you like that. And what does she mean by you're not allowed to work? And he had too many questions, which I could not answer then. I was just in <laughs> panic, panic mode, and I didn't know what to do. I just tried to explain to him. He was like, okay. So what do you want us to do that? Do you want to continue working? I'm like, is this man okay? Are you asking me if I want to continue working in this second? This in this, yes. <laughs> so this is where the second miracle plays out for me, you know, and God proves himself, you know. Mm -hmm. Sometimes when he tells us, gives us instruction, as you said, he's a rewarder. The reward doesn't come immediately. Yeah. It's, it, you know, God works in mysterious ways. He's he is author and finisher. He he knows how he's written the story. Yeah. And this was one of those places in my life again where I'm like, God, what is happening? You know, here am I, I've been convocated for tomorrow, and they said they're gonna terminate my I-20. You know, send me back to Cameroon. I'm I'm here thinking, like, okay, so what's going on now? So I call my uncle. With the immediate relative here. Yeah. I explained yeah. things to him and I said he needs to be here tomorrow. You know what he told me? He's like, don't don't give anybody my number. Oh don't no. Call, don't, don't call my phone. Oh no. Who told, who told you to go out there working and exposing yourself? That was his answer, and the story ends there. Oh, he, never, no. he never paid attention to that and he really never cared. <laughs> so here am I. Supposed to go for a meeting tomorrow. I tell the story to this lady who works with the school and everything. She's so confused. She's like, Emmanuel, oh no, what do we do? She's concerned, worried. She doesn't know what to do. She tells me, talk to Pastor Jeff. Pastor Jeff is the intern pastor in the, at the Second Baptist Church. Uh -huh. This guy and who begged me to come and play for them. And I knew he wasn't just begging me, but I knew God was actually instructing me to go there. And I obeyed. Yeah. When I told Pastor Jeff that he immediately, with no hesitation, said, hey, don't worry, I'm going to come there tomorrow for you. I'll be there. He, call, he calls me Taco. He doesn't know how to pronounce <laughs> Yeah. Hey, Taco, I'm going to come there tomorrow. Don't worry, I'm going to come there tomorrow. Wow. I'm telling you, and this meeting holds, you know, they tell me all the, the rules are broken and all that, you know, how they need to terminate my head 20 and both of us are seated there. You know, I have Pastor Jeff seated by me as my uh, um, as my uh, sponsor. Yeah. And, yeah, my guardian. His name is not the name on file. The name on file doesn't show up. And you know, they're like, "Well, this is complicated, but we're gonna." Since you you said, "Well, he's there," okay, we're gonna listen to him. So after they talk and they tell me all the the laws are broken and you know what's expected, you know, and what's gonna happen, they tell me out so they can address him and i'm telling you he, he wasn't in there for up to five minutes and when he came out he just stabbed me on the back he said everything is okay you're fine he says I'm <laughs> he says i'm rushing for an appointment and stuff i'm, I'm going to talk to you later and he left quickly left because he's a busy guy and they come in there like you are one lucky that where did you know this guy from like wow telling me and all of this was just because of his, his um, uh, his person in the society, in the, in the community that he's well known. Mm. Know the name Jeff Henry. If you call that name, everybody. So it was everybody like, know. yes. You presented me, and they are like, "How did you know this guy?" I'm telling you, I don't know. That he didn't spend up to five minutes, and the the case was closed. 
Can you imagine? God had God knew what was going to happen ahead of time and was setting you up. This is yes. amazing. Yes, yes, and the, wow, that is one testimony as well that I always share with people to encourage them. Like you know, God works in mysterious ways. Like just sometimes, just obey. You know, you see, called um, uh, um, uh, I said Abraham. You know, God. Come, come out of your father's house, go into the place that I, sh I will show you. It's always like that for God. He never shows you the big picture. Just obey its instruction as it comes. Yes. You might not know what's next. You might not know how he's going to do what he's going to do. Just trust and obey. Yes. <laughs> and I learned to do that time and time again. My walk with him, there's that track record of making little covenants with him that God you know, you, you said I should do this. So if I do this, make sure. Please, <laughs> me because man, I don't know what you're saying here. Yeah. And that's how it's been for me and God. And so um, that's the story then. From there, you know, I continued school. God gave me wisdom and how to raise my fees. I was able to sign up for, um, to be a tutor at my school because I performed oh. so excellently during my first term, although I dropped out. Mm -hmm. So when I re-enrolled after summer, I was a tutor at the Success Center in school. Okay. And I um, um, uh, introduction to computers, something like that. And God gave me wisdom while I tutored that class. He gave me some wisdom on how the class goes, the curriculum. And I was able to study that curriculum to the point where I could help others. There were a lot of Cameroonians who came through the school that I came through who were doing nursing. And a lot of them were very lazy. When it, came, when it comes to computers, they didn't want to do it. So they would have to pay me to handle mm. for them. And that is how I was able to take care of myself with that money, that income. Because after that scenario, I was stuck because now they had eyes on me. I, I had yes. to stay, just be there. Get whatever you can job you can get in school, and mm -hmm. while tutor, you know the Lord just opened doors for me. I helped a lot of people. People just love to come to me for, for me to teach them, you know, computer stuff because I was patient. Even the especially the older guys, each time they, they record, they're like, "We want Emmanuel. He's the one who teaches," you know. And I begin to see how God prepared that, put that patience in me throughout my walk with Him to be patient. No, in just so many ways, you know. Yeah. The ministry that I'm with right, I'm with, I work with right now, I'm one of those leaders who have stood firm through the ups and the downs. Like the things that I, any person who is just a leader who just said, These people are not serious, I'll probably leave. You yeah. Know? But I know the Lord prepared me for such places. Mm -hmm. Ministries that are struggling, and like you go there and you be there until I tell you, Okay, it's time to leave. It's always yeah. been. At the Second Baptist Church, I, I served there so much that even when I moved to Des Moines, like away from the school, these guys would still call me, like, Emmanuel, we miss you. Please come back. <laughs> I'm sorry. The Lord has told me, you know, that, that was the, the time when I had to serve there. I served yeah. the next phase. And mm -hmm. in that way, and it's always been, you know, side by side. I've never really splitted my work with God and my professional career. Mm -hmm finished from my associates I got a job then I met my wife we got married so I was able to assimilate get my green card mm -hmm. then I continued my education did my bachelor's in a, um, IT service management at the University of Bellevue in Nebraska oh, okay yeah all of this while still serving God you know full-time I switched when I left Ottawa which is the school where I did my associate school I moved on to Des Moines which is mm -hmm. where now which is the capital city of iowa and there i you know went into a lutheran church which was just a transition i was waiting yeah. to hear and in that time he had not spoken so i, I just you know fellowship with a uh, 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 lutheran church and there um, one of my colleagues at work she was like a, a more senior colleague she was like i think head of finance or something mm -hmm. that she was a worship leader it was it was oh. strange to see someone in such a high position and serving. Yeah. So all of these things, I began to like, wow, the Lord began to draw me closer to people like this. And yeah. many times 
went to our office and we just discussed faith, you know. You yeah. know, almost a, a, it's a foreign thing to talk about God in, you know, the workplace here. But, you know, the mm-hmm. strategies and how to do that. Yeah. Being all like, okay, you know, we must do it this way. No, we must force it like this. No, it must be strategic. You must yeah. use it. Yeah. We, always the principal thing, you know. Yeah. You know, so some people might just claim that, no, I'll preach God. I must say Jesus in this place. And, you know, but sometimes that's not the way to go about it. And God would sometimes give us wisdom on how to still mm-hmm. create a space until they are ready for it to be, you know, publicly mention it or, you know, how it is. Yes, yes. So you still have to use wisdom, you know. Mm-hmm. Yep. Has, if in the space they've said, okay, there's freedom of religion, don't force your religion on someone else and all of this. Well, we're going to respect that. But mm-hmm. oh, as God leads us, you know, he would start touching you on who to talk to first, how to go about it. So I know that was just how he moved. And he started pointing me to people who were believers in the space, and I began to identify them. And that is how we began to form our cliques, you know, and yeah. a space we sit down and we talk freely, you know, about faith. And with, with each of those people, I told them my story, you know, and God has always had, I tell them my story, they're always amazed. It's always like we're in America here and we go through little challenges in life and we think that it's the end. <laughs> Give up. Everybody I talk with is always that way. They're like, man, we're how did you do that? Like, like your story is just encouraging. Like you make me just feel like, oh, I'm such a baby. And, you know, I'm telling you, she would talk like, you know, the little things I just want to give up. And when I hear your story, I'm, I'm really encouraged in my faith. And, you know, it's oh, that's always the narrative. Yeah. That's why my pastor here always says that the, 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 the Christianity here is watered down. Like the church here is being baby fed. Like, they only tell them what they want to hear, what will tickle their ears, and what will keep them there. But they don't give things that will, you know, help them grow. And mm-hmm. if you know, have babies in the church, you know, and who are not growing, are not maturing into sonship. They're, not, they're still spiritual babies, you know. I, 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 I would say it's not even just the people who sit in the pews. Some yeah. hour, I would not call, but I was having a conversation with someone who used to be a minister. Mm. And life happened. Mm. And now they are in a place where, why did God allow me? And I'm like, like in my mind, I'm like, come on, give me a break. Yes, that's because... Life the- happens to everybody. Like, how would you question God's faithfulness just because of yes. this? I would consider it I, a little thing. I'm telling you, I've and come... And the person is out of ministry now. They don't want to preach. They don't want to do... I said, but at least, even if you don't want to preach, you don't have to preach. How is your heart with God? Like, yes. oh, I'm... It's just, it's, it's, you know, that's because of the, the corporate style, you know, Christianity just being a religion, not a lifestyle, not a personal thing, you know, it's absent, whereby when people are absent from church, if you take church out of the picture, then there's really no faith, there's no relationship, and a lot of them are that way, and, you know, I've met even my, my dentist, you know, the story we had to, you know, She's an atheist, but she used to be a Christian. And it's just because of life. Life happened and she failed the little test of faith. She, she just, whew. so you were brought up as a Christian and a Christian with everything. And this happened and you gave up and said, now you believe in Mother Earth and yeah. leave it. Like, how is that possible? Were you really saved in the first place? You yes. know, and we begin to ask these questions, you know, and it's, it's just a mess, you know, and well, the reason I kind of wonder if people even read scriptures because if you read scriptures, look at you gave the example of Daniel and his friends. Like there are there are stories and narratives over and over in scriptures of suffering, of pain, of and then God shows us how do we live through that. It's not That's like the, right. the Bible is sugar coated with only nice things. Like you Absolutely. have all of it. So Absolutely. why do I think that I'll be exempt from? Uh... Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, um, I'm kind of losing my train of thought here, but yeah, the Lord, you know, has opened doors while I have walked side by side him and, uh, you know, I've learned my way with him. We all have a walk with God and you must, yeah, that's, 
you must know how how you guys deal. For me and God, we yes. have a, we have a way that we, we go about our things, yes. you know, and I've developed that style of relationship with him. Like there are times when we make covenants and I've seen how he keeps those covenants and when I break it as a son, he makes sure that he makes me to know that you broke this covenant. And he makes me to, to yield the, the fruits of it and then he teaches me, he treats me like a son. And that is how God treats us. Sometimes, if you're still a baby, when you break some things, he will show mercy. He will, he will be yes. like, oh, mercy. But when you're maturing. Oh, you know, man, I know that. Is, no, 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 no. It will be a no, no. He's going to make sure that he treats with you as a son. Yeah. And that has been my walk with him. And I've noticed times when, you know, I've, you know, failed in one or the other and I'll repent. And, you know, the spirit will just convict me. You know, he will just... Let me know, Emmanuel, I know I've left you to do this, but at a certain time, you're just like, you know, you're an error here, you know, you're an error there. And that has been my walk with him, though. you know. And one time I'll tell you one of the really secrets, um, secrets with me and him. And I remember one time when, uh, that was just before the pandemic, before COVID, I had just um, graduated from my bachelor's um, uh, school. And I, you know, I was doing my very first job in IT. And, uh, you know, I wasn't very satisfied. I was like, is this it? You know, is this, is this it? You know, like, you know, I didn't, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't very content with where I was. I don't know if that's the right word, you know, but I felt like there was more. Yeah. But, you know, and then, um, so I resigned from my first job. I resigned from my first job. I don't know why I did that. Some people told me you don't resign from a job when you haven't gotten another one, which is wise, which is the way to go about it, right? So I'm gonna say, hey, I'm done then, thinking that you're all that and you're gonna just have a, that happened, I think, um, December of 2019, then the pandemic just hit 2020, I believe, during that period. And I was unemployed for like five months because I thought I was gonna get a job quick. I was doing interviews. And then the pandemic came and it became a disaster. Yep. So it was prolonged. That period, everybody knows it was so tough here where nothing was going on. If, yeah. you, if, you, if you didn't have a job, then just forget about it. Because <laughs> I know it's time because everyone was closed down. You know, the world was adjusting and changing to what, was, yep. what they were experiencing. And then here am I, I put myself in this situation, not knowing God orchestrated it to be so. Mm. <laughs> you know? That was a period where I had to pause because I also backslided a little bit. I got sucked in into the system. Now yeah, I have a job, yeah. you know, um, like, you know, and it started pulling me away. And God saw, huh, <laughs> now you are being sucked in by the system. Mm. And in his mercy, while I would describe it as a tragedy, he caused me to make some moves. And I made that move. <laughs> and during that five months of unemployment was like a, he like recalibrated me, like pulled my attention to a lot of things, how I backslided in this area and that area and followed yeah. me. And that was a season where he walked on me again and mm -hmm. brought me back on track, you know? Mm -hmm. And to others, they'll see it just as a bad luck or like, a, what's going on? You know, I'm going through one of those moments, you know, where everybody struggles and stuff. But for me, I came to understand what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And that was when I made my very first covenant with him like a covenant with God. I remember one night I sat down and I was like, Father, why am I in this situation? Mm -hmm. I'm, like, I'm like the firstborn in my family. Everybody's looking up to me. They're expecting so much of me. I have siblings. I have a family here. I have so much. And I need, I need to do something. I cannot be sitting here. So many people are looking up to me. And then he began to speak. Mm -hmm. I remember it's, even my relationship was in chaos, you know. You know, I, there was so much going on. I'm telling you, I really drifted away from the faith. I'm telling you, I drifted away. And that was also during the transition period where he had to show me the next phase of my assignment, but I got too distracted and I wasn't listening anymore. <laughs> I wasn't also going to church a lot. You know, I wasn't, you know, into the things of God so much. I was really carried away. At that point, you know, I was still connected in a little way, but 
I was just sucked in by, you know, that first, you know, like stage of success. Like, oh, now yes. you yes, job, you get your car, you know that. It's like, oh, you know then now, now I'm somebody. And your things started kicking in. And that's why I say I don't want to judge people, but, you know, to understand that God deals with us in seasons and phases, and it is by his grace that if we, stand, we really stand, you know, so that if we stand, we stand. And yeah. I'm not forgetting the prayers of those around us, you know, yeah. my mother, you know, and those that you, people like you and others that still pray. The, yeah. the one you don't even know they pray for you. You don't even know. Those prayers in those times are what keep you afloat. You know, yeah. at that time, I made a covenant with God and he told me, Emmanuel, remember that how we've always done things. You are called and you are chosen. You are not just another person out there, but I've called and chosen you as, you know, an instrument to advance. So, you don't have to mess around. When I tell you how to do things, that is how you have to do it. And he started rebuking me and showing me things like, you've drifted away, you know, and my work is suffering in one way or the other because your ears have been shot. I've been talking mm -hmm. by the affairs of life. You've been so sucked in and you're not listening to me anymore. I'm telling you that night was a night when I wept, you know, and I was listening to a message by um, uh, Dr. Cindy Trim, you know, and that it just hit me so hard and you know she was you know she kind of changed my perspective on a lot of things and she, that night was one of those nights when i had to sow another seed and that was i had to empty my account that was the last money i had i was unemployed no money in there the last dollar amount there and there she was and she was like you know you need to sow that seed and i don't remember what that message message was but mm -hmm. now you're going to take out all that money it was a thousand dollars and this thousand dollars, mind you, wasn't money that I had. It was money that one of my very good friends who knew my situation sent to me. He mm. was like, man, I know what you're going through. Hold this one. He's, he's one of my, my brothers in the faith too here. He's also in IT. We run businesses together. He's like, one that the Lord has kind of paired. Our destiny is kind of, you know, a paired. Yeah. Extend, you know. I encourage him so much in the faith. He sees me as a mentor, you know, something like that. So can you imagine in such a situation <laughs> and you, someone says you something to just hold yourself and God says that one, that's the seed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh my God, I thought this is money I used to pay rent maybe and sustain, but he was like, no, nope. that's it. So that was another moment when I had to sacrifice that seed. That was my offering for the covenant we're making. Mm -hmm. He was sacrifice this and he told me how to do it he's like you're going to send half of this to your mom who is like one who stands as your first spiritual authority yes ah. and then the other one you give to um uh the the the, the ministry i'm submitted under right now you know uh, mm -hmm. apostle daniel the israel he said you're going to send the rest to him and you tell them exactly the purpose for this seed and what i'm telling you and that was the day the Lord told me where I'm going to be and where he's mm. going to be. I don't know when it's going to happen in Tobelma, but he told me he's going to get me into so much wealth. Like he's going to bless me. He'll put me in like a million dollar category. I don't know what, but he told me things he was going to do. He was going to make me a kingdom financier, a financier and just bless me with so much. You know, he would, so, I will not be surprised. Well, like, you know, he would make me a custodian of world, kind of, you know, and, you know, just someone that would manage the wealth, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. So I wrote, that is the first time in my life where I wrote things down. I usually don't write. See this book right here? And since I wrote, I hardly opened it. I'm afraid to even read the things God told me. I wrote the things in this book. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm afraid to read them because I don't know how they will happen or when. You don't, but, you don't, I, I don't think you have to worry about the how, yeah, because he always yeah. keeps his covenant. But then yeah. I would say it's good to open and read and pray over it. Like Paul told Timothy, yes. consent for the prophecies that has been given to you, amen. So, amen. Yeah, yes, yeah. But okay. I would not, I, I, I would not be surprised a little bit if God would not say that, or if he doesn't do that, I would be surprised instead. Hmm. Yeah. So when he spoke to me that night, I wrote those things down. 
And uh, the only person that shared with me was my wife. And I told her, she was just laughing at me and saying, is this your condition now? We, we have to solve what's going on right now. So the, <laughs> she, you know, women worry so much. You know? And she's one of those that, you know, I, I always try to help her to, to build her faith, you know. Uh, she's a child of God. She's from a Muslim background. Okay. And, uh, you know, yeah, but she's one of those who, you know, by the grace of God. Yeah, she, I like to get to know her. So when I go to Liberia next time, then I can connect yeah. to her. Exactly. Yeah, she's she's very warm-hearted. You know, the Lord really paired us. You know, for a reason. And uh, you know, she's one of those that I always have to encourage her that you know God is working. You know, despite don't look at what we're going through right now. Things will be better. And you know, I always tell her these things. So I said, obey the Lord. You know, I obey this instruction. And I told him even the kind of job I'm looking for, the next kind of job I want, it to the to the details of the kind of pay. I don't want, I don't want any job that will stress me. I told him I don't want a job that will stress me, you know. And I'm asking him all these things in my own, you know, we're making a covenant there and I'm spelling out everything I yep. want. You uh -huh. know? And I said, spell it out. That's when he tells me that it's okay, I'll give you these things, but what you're asking for is nothing compared to what to what <laughs> I even have to for you. <laughs> so it was that kind of thing where when I'm talking, he was just kind of laughing. Like it's like, he, and he was telling me it's okay. Uh, of course, I'm going to give you these things, but it, it doesn't compare. It's not even an inch mm -hmm. of what I really have in mind for you. And then he started downloading them, and I and then I started writing. And I'm like, God, have mercy on me. Sometimes we we act like we we know what we we is good for us, mm -hmm. you know, but we really have no idea. Yeah, we have no idea. And right after that, as I obeyed, you know, and sowed that seed, and I'm telling you, <laughs> the results were so immediate. Wow. As that score, he corrected me, showed me my runs and everything. He said, okay, now your next level of your assignment is this and that and that and that. I agreed to it and everything. And I'm telling you, the next couple of weeks, everything started falling in place. Man. Everything. I was speechless. I sat down like this. I'm like, oh my God. God, you are like, you are so real. Thank you for showing yourself to me over and over again. You know, just like you promised, you know, you said, uh, Abraham and Sarah, you know, I'll bless your descendants will be like the stars. And yes, you couldn't even have one son. And mm -hmm. <laughs> that's when he doubted God, you know. And I found myself in that place. And when the promise came, you know, I was like, and, and you know, you know, Someone who has gone and gotten, um, what was the illegitimate son before Isaac? Um, yes, Ishmael. The Ishmael, yeah. I felt like someone who went ahead of God thinking that he was not going to keep to his promise. You know, and I, I was just repenting in front of him when I saw him come through with exactly what I asked for. You know, not too long from when I made the promise. So yeah. here am I sitting during the pandemic when people don't have jobs. During the pandemic, I get a call from a recruiter. And this recruiter tells me, I found your resume online and I feel you're going to be a good fit for this position. Now, I was growing in my IT career. I started as a help desk person. That's the lowest level of IT where you do like service desk jobs, you know. Mm -hmm. And for the next level, I was just looking to pivot to like a, an administrator analyst type of role, you know. And I was trusting God. I was like, well, please just help me to move from this stage to this stage. You know, in IT, you know, I do a lot of uh, mentorship and I help people to pivot because sometimes when you spend so much time at the, 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 the entry level, it's so hard to pivot out of there. Yes. You know? So that was one of the challenges I faced. I did like 10 interviews and they kept telling me, well, oh, you know, for one reason or the other, I don't think you're fit. I was like, that's after I resigned. <laughs> I was one <laughs> to the other, and I could not believe my eyes. Wow. I'm like, why? Like, what's wrong? Why can I not get something? You know? I didn't know this was God causing all of this thing. You know? Uh -huh. was like, Maybe you're not hearing me, so I'll call you, God. I'll look for another way to call you back to me, you know? Objections. <laughs> Even when I got one job, which I thought was the good one, you know, then they hired me and then they, then they told me you're starting on this day and they kept postponing the day and then they discontinued the job. Oh, wow. <laughs> that, that was like the, the stroke on the back, like, bam. 
and then God worked things out, you know, after he, we had this, you know, um, encounter, I had this encounter, you know, with him. He told me those things, which I wrote down. And then when we settled things, I knew I was at peace with him. And then he instructed me on, you know, my next assignment, which I was already, you know, in, you know, serving with uh, Kingdom Information Center Global. And then he, he opened the door now for, you know, the next level. One of the things he told me that if you continue to serve in my vineyard, I would also make you excel in the public space on the corporate mm -hmm. space. That was one of the things. Like, mm -hmm. serve me with excellence. You, you know how you used to do it. Don't give yes. me average. No. Average service. Everything. Yes. Give you everything here. And if you do that, okay, I'll keep pushing you up on the side too. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, you know, that's it. And as soon as we made that covenant and we sealed it at Tzvelma, a miracle. Someone called me, this recruiter called me and says, oh, we see this job, we think you're fit for. And I'll tell you, when I looked at the job, I was nowhere close to the minimum qualifications. So I'm like, who is this coming to tell me you're fit for this? Like, I, oh. it makes sense to me. Was, the girl, it was a lady, she was like, no, 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 no. I really think, Emmanuel, I really think you're fit for this. I'm like, whatever. Oh, wow. Go ahead and put in the application. So she went ahead and put in, get my resume in. And then before I knew it, the, the next day, she called and said, they want to talk with you. They're interested. Wow. Mind you, this is during the pandemic. She said, they want to talk with you. This was an engineering level job. I wasn't looking for oh, one. Of my. I wasn't even dreaming of an engineering level job. That's why when it came to me, I told her, I'm not looking for engineering level. I'm looking for something in the middle. All right. <laughs> then God on the other hand is like, oh God, what did you ask for? You asked yeah. for, you know, something. I'm trying to give you that thing. Why are you? So I told her, go ahead. And lo and behold, she said they're interested in you. I did first interview. Says they like you. They booked me for a second one with a team. The team likes you. Booked me for a third one with the, the, the chief security officer of the company, then booked me a fourth one. I went to four interviews with that company. Oh, and God was trying to show me something which I really didn't even understand. Bottom line is I got the offer and I could not believe I got the offer. When I got the offer and I started working, the, 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 the HR department told me that they were trying to enroll me and they couldn't find my name in the system. So they told me to go and apply for the job. <laughs> they were like, you did not apply for this job. So your name is not on the system. We don't see you there. So now uh -huh. you just go and act as if you are applying, but we've already hired you. So I got hired for a job I did not apply for. Wow. Someone found my, my stuff on the, on the stuff, went ahead and submitted it, and they just boycotted all those processes. And all the protocols. And hired me, and then when I got hired, they told me, we don't see your name on the system, you need to go apply, just for four wow. it, it was a, It was another eye-opener for me, like, okay, I got a job I'm not applying for, right? <laughs> what I asked for, it was exactly the kind of pay I asked for. It was a work-from-home job, fully remote job, yeah. and the beginning of, like, my next level. God just, he just gave me a glimpse. Yes. Show you that. What you asked for, I can give you and more. Yeah. So, and while I was there, he told me, continue to excel. He, he took me into that engineering job to stretch me, to show me that I had more capacity than what I thought I had. So, yeah. Aspect of building excellence, you know, in, you know, in the area of, you know, your professional career, you know, and all that, you know, because I was a little bit laid back, I was a little bit relaxed, and he wanted to push me out of that comfort zone like if you want to be a lead someone who operate in excellence you would need to you know get out of this shell of you know being laid back and that was what that engineering job taught me i was stretched beyond like i never knew that i could do what you know i even told my mom to pray for me i told her look at what i've cost myself for praying to god for blessing i've entered blessing now i'm, I'm, I'm Not praying. Yet. oh my god she was like, no, Emmanuel, you know, I'm praying for you. You're going to do well. Keep doing. Yes. One of those who stood by me and pushed. And uh, 
I saw myself pushing beyond my limits, you know, and today I have my master's in, uh, you know, in IT, cloud computing architecture with the University of Maryland. And from there, he, he, he kept pushing me like, you know, like, okay, you, you think this is where it ends? And he tells me dare to push. And when I dare to push, I achieve that next level. And it's like, you think this is where it ends? It's like, keep pushing. Yeah. And I dare to push and he keeps taking me, you know, yeah. to the point where I'm right now, I cannot even believe myself. Mm -hmm. It's still like a dream. And he tells me, and at some point when I start to brag about it, he tells me, be careful. Mm -hmm. He will deal with me. And this is how I've really learned. And again, as I said, my work with God is never a divide between professional and working with God. It's always been one thing. Yeah. He's always been working. That's why I can be very effective in the work of God. Because I'm studying excellence in Egypt. I'm studying excellence in Babylon. Yes, yes, yes. That's so good. That is that is where I'm studying excellence. And I think I think that at times that's my problem. At times I feel like in church with the sense of excellence is it's like we, it's okay to be mediocre, but I'm like, no, it's yes. not. Exactly. I mean it's beginning to change a little bit now where there's some level this some institutes of excellence, you know, yeah. and the Christian organizations that, you know, work with that level base because I can tell you the pioneers went through that system. Yeah, that's true. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. They studied either in Pharaoh's house or in a Potiphar's house or yeah. in the king's palace. But those that the Lord is using to now build that level of excellence, like right now, I was appointed as the global administrator for this ministry because I'm setting up the administrative structure and bringing that excellence, which is lacking in yeah. the body and the church. And I'm telling we, you- We want to pray in tongues and then the Holy Spirit will come and get it done. Come, come, come <laughs> and help us organize. And, you know, well, that's, that's far from it. That's far from it. So, you know, that's just a little bit of my story. And, you know, I've been able through that. Um, today, I'm blessed to work with um, uh, the Federal Bank here. Okay. Yeah. You know, I'm in the cyberspace. I work as an information security engineer there, which is also a miracle job, which, again, I'm someone held by God and Tivama. And nobody yes. so is get it wrong. If I'm where I am today, it's not because of these qualifications. It's been God throughout. And every time he shows me, when I try to brag about it, he will tell me that, remember, you're not here because of your own power or your own working. I put you here. Mm. I'm, 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 I'm humbled by that. Yeah. You know, and when I when I teach people, help people, they ask, how how do you how do you become what you became? I'm telling you, even people used to be with me at school. When they come and see where God has brought me, that person used to struggle. The email we used to know, <laughs> I used to beg that, oh, let me even marry you for papers now. And oh like, ah, please. You know. I'm telling you, I got a lot of rejection. But today, people are just amazed when they see where God has placed me. The kind mm. of, it's like, it's, it's unmatched. I'm telling you, Auntie Velma, if yeah. you come to the city of the morning and ask in the Cameroonian community, Emmanuel, the reports you get will be one of, you know, you'll be very proud of. Amen. Amen. In every space. Amen. Every space. Every space. And I don't know how I commanded that kind of respect. I, mm. I don't know if it happened mistakenly, but it just shows that, you know, when we walk in virtue and, you know, all these, you know, disciplines, you know, God is working something and using us to be an example, to truly be the light and to truly be the salt. It's not just yeah. by, you know, yes, being spiritual and praying, but it's a combination of things. Yeah. You know, God, God wants us to, to be fully conformed to the image of Christ. And it takes very different things. You pass you through different mm -hmm. trainings, different schools. And as you submit yourself and continuously surrender and die in all these areas, mm -hmm. that's how he will lift you and also use you, you know, as, um, you know, a, a major catalyst for his kingdom. So. Yeah. You know, that's that's it. <laughs> oh man, this is so so good. This is so good. This is just so good. I, I really hope that it is inspiring someone who is watching and you're being challenged, your faith is being stirred, and you're 
like say, hey, it's time to get out of the box. Maybe you came here and you're like, oh, I don't want to. I think it was the same when I came. I had some few family members who were like, you don't have to waste your time in school. Just yeah. come get it. We'll help you get it. I was like, no, yeah. I came for a purpose. And so to challenge somebody, like at times it's easy to just come jump and get the work and you get quick money. But mm. think yeah. five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now. That's how right. different would that be? And different. is that even the job you want to do for the rest of your life? Because if you don't think, like, yeah. you find yourself in a place where you're going to be stuck and True. down the road you live in regret. So hope this is encouraging you, inspiring you, challenging you. Uh, thank you so much, Emmanuel, for sharing. Amen. So I'm going to ask, do you have any last thoughts that you want to? Mm. My last thoughts is this, you know, um, God is always looking for a man to stand in the gap. Mm. God is always looking for a man to stand in the gap. And um, the tough seasons of our lives, uh, we should always understand that they are our preparation. Yeah. Although some of us went through it without realizing, but God was really preparing us. And so for anyone watching, you might be going through a challenge, one challenge or the other, be it, you know, being in, you know, here in the United States, there is the issue of people not having papers. It's a big major one. Yeah. Some people are going through abuse and just name it. The, 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 I mean, people can tell you their stories and you just be amazed how they keep a smile on their face. I know it's... But... One thing I want to tell you is keep standing firm. Don't give up. Amen. As he said in Ecclesiastics, you know, uh, Solomon, one of the wisest kings, said that the race is not to a suit. He says, I look under the sun and I saw that this race is not to those who know how to run well. Mm. <laughs> You know, or food to the one who has wisdom. Oh, and I've just forgotten how that scripture goes, you know, just paraphrasing. But he says, time and chance happens to them all. You know, if you will go to, if you will get to your season of increase and abundance or that place where God has promised you, yeah. it will not be by, you know, all the good works, all the education, as we've spoken about here. Mm. Or, you know, being morally upright, which is very important. You know, it will not be by your, your intellectual capacity, you know, or how much money you have or the family you're coming from or the job you're doing. But especially for believers, it will be by the hand of God. Amen. It will be by the hand of God. Amen. The Lord wants to bring us to the place where we would be so broken where we will be so selfless to the point where he becomes the center. He becomes the, the one that we push forward all the time. Mm -hmm. Never a time should we speak as a believer and we say me, 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 and there is no Christ who sits the center. Yeah. He should always be the center. That is the lesson I learned. Man. And he told me if you would be the one that I would use to change situation, to influence government, then you must be the one who is completely selfless. Amen. Die every day in all facets. You are ready to show me, to put me in front and mm. for you, you know, to be, to be back with that self, self, because here in the West thing was all about self, what I'm doing, what I am, my job, my money, my this, you know, and God is becoming tired of, Tired of that. Mm -hmm. And he wants those that are going to, you know, be ready to surrender everything and put him in front. Mm -hmm. So as we walk, you know, different aspects of our life, you know, in our career, you know, in our service, you know, with him in the church, and just wherever we find ourselves, remember that God is always looking for someone to stand in the gap. And if, you're, and if you're that one, if you're that chosen one, you're not going to be exempted from. The fire, you're not going to be tempted from the, the, the water. He says you will go through that fire, but you'll not be burned. Yeah. Because he, in that, he's going to purify you. You go through the water, but you're not going to drown. 
he's going to keep you afloat mm -hmm. because he's preserving you for a particular purpose. And the time is coming. The time is now for some of you. You know, be encouraged. Stand firm. Don't give up on God because he will never give up on you. Amen. Amen. Oh, man. This is so good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Man, thank you, online family, for watching this. Uh, if it inspires you, send it to someone that you know, someone who's going through a difficult season. Uh, let it inspire them. Let, them. let it challenge them also. And leave us a feedback. Leave, if, you are, if you are here in the diaspora, or tell us a little about your experience. Let's hear sure. your experience to inspire somebody else. So thank you, Emmanuel, for joining us this morning and for sharing. Uh, well, I don't know. It might be afternoon.